but our next presenter. Um, and I think probably most people already know Peter, but in case not, uh, Peter Druckmeyer is our policy director. He joined uh, TRT staff in August 2007. And he uh, was raised on Palo Alto, in Palo Alto, Chichi Water, and he knows the Bay Area very well. In 1990, he founded Bay Area Action, which is now called Actera, and has coordinated two International Earth Day campaigns. He has extensive experience working on land use initiatives. Peter's a whitewater rafting guide and former mayor of Palo Alto. So take it away, Peter. Thanks. Um, so Tuolumne River Trust, we were born into advocacy. It was at a time when more dams were proposed for the Tuolumne River. So TRT was founded in 1981. Uh, that handsome gentleman there at the microphone is John Amadio, who's on this Zoom right now. Uh, he was our first executive director. Over on the far left of the table is Richard Chamberlain, the heartthrob from the Thornbirds series. He was our, he got us national attention. And in 1984, we got wild and status for the Tuolumne. So that means no new dams allowed and no development along the banks. And that was the beginning of Tuolumne River Trust. Um, a lot of impacts on the Tuolumne over the years and Hap touched on some of these, gold, you know, the gold mining, uh, agriculture, logging, ranching, striped bass um, were introduced in 1879 and they are a non-native predator species. Uh, the first dam or the second dam really, but uh, LaGrange was built in 1893. And then you had Don Pedro Dam for agriculture and O'Shaughnessy Dam, which is the Hetchetchi Reservoir in, completed in 1923. And despite all of those impacts in 1944, which was a pretty good year for salmon, we had 130,000 salmon spawning, despite all those previous impacts. In 1970, new Don Pedro Dam was completed. And since then we've seen a precipitous decline in salmon. So here's the, um, the entire watershed. You see that the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir is in Yosemite National Park. Uh, Don Pedro downstream of that. We're focusing a lot of attention on Don Pedro right now. And flows through Modesto to the San Joaquin up into the Delta and the Bay. And beautiful scenery and recreation and wildlife habitat. This is Tuolumne Meadows. This is the Grand Canyon of the Tuolumne. And of course, here's O'Shaughnessy Dam and the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. And that is where our 85% of our drinking water, for those of us who get it from the SFPUC, comes from Hetch Hetchy. And the other 15% from Bay Area sources, Bay Area watersheds, and serves 2.7 million people in four counties. So below O'Shaughnessy is world-class white water, uh, just a, a wonderful, place to experience the river and have some excitement and also have some nice leisure. Uh, there are beautiful swimming holes, waterfalls, great fishing. And so the, for all those reasons, the Tuolumne is now a wild and scenic river, the upper Tuolumne, 83 miles. And in 2013, the Rim Fire burned 257,000 acres. Um, we Tuolumne River Trust is part of a coalition called Yosemite Stanislaus Solutions. And it's made up of loggers, ranchers, um, environmentalists, recreationists. And so it's really trying to pull together all the stakeholders. And it was really wonderful that that organization existed because after the Rim Fire, there was a lot of talk about salvage logging. And the Forest Service proposed a tremendous amount of logging, new logging roads, access into the Clavy River watershed. And YSS, um, which Patrick was very involved in and is a co-chair right now, came up with a compromise that reduced the amount of salvage logging by two thirds, uh, prevented new roads, protected the Clavy. And the loggers supported that because they didn't want a lot of lawsuits. They, there were still plenty of wood to service all the local mills and lawsuits would have delayed the logging. And after about a year and a half, the bark beetles get in there and it's just not as valuable wood. So they, we went hand in hand to the Forest Service and they basically adopted the plan. So that was a, a huge victory. And the Rim Fire, 97% of it, maybe 98, was in the uh, Tuolumne River watershed. So we're now very engaged 
in um, forest management to make sure that such wildfires don't happen in the future. So um, very involved in the policy there and, and Patrick and our crew in the Sonora office are doing great work on that in addition to the habitat restoration. So this is Don Pedro Dam, new Don Pedro, uh, about 600 feet tall dam. Uh, it's the sixth largest reservoir in the state and the Tuolumne upstream of the reservoir is the wild and scenic stretch. So Don Pedro was licensed in 66 by FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and it was a 50 year license. So it was supposed to be relicensed by 2016. It's a long process. We've been engaged the whole way through. Uh, where we stand right now is a draft environmental impact statement was released last year. We commented, it was a disappointing document. It's, it's more of the, you know, the Trump administration kind of rolling over to water interests, especially in uh, red uh, st uh, states and, and counties in this case. Um, but we are, you know, we've made some progress. We did convince FERC that LaGrange Dam downstream, two miles, uh, should require a license. It never had before. And the reason this is important is that the irrigation districts were saying they didn't want to study fish passage, the idea of getting fish, anadromous fish that live in the ocean and come back to the freshwater over their Don Pedro Dam into that wonderful habitat in the upper Tuolumne, their historic habitat. And uh, we argued that um, LaGrange was really a functional part of a system, including Don Pedro. And um, FERC did rule that LaGrange would need a dam. And there's been some talk about uh, fish passage. It's not gonna happen soon, but possibly in the future. So that did slow down the process a little bit and just a lot of other dynamics, including things like the drought and you know, waiting to see what happens with the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan, which I'll talk about in a bit. But downstream of LaGrange is a beautiful stretch of river. It's very different. It's not the white water you see in the upper, but um, just very peaceful. This is where we take our supporters on our um, canoeing with the salmon trips in early November, which are just a wonderful time. If you haven't had a chance to do it, I encourage you to do so. Um, so we, in good years, we see some salmon coming up to spawn. You see carcasses. Um, they, these are fall run Chinook salmon, which are also called king salmon, and you can see why they can get pretty big. And something we emphasize that is this isn't just about, you know, people versus fish or farmers versus fish. It's really a whole ecosystem. And salmon bring tremendous amounts of marine derived nutrients, nutrients from the ocean into the upland habitats, where they really fuel a whole food web. So we think of it as a, a salmon based ecosystem. And unfortunately, that nutrient conveyor belt has been severely restricted um, in recent years. And we're trying to revive um, this key species uh, to revive the rest of the ecosystem. We also have steelhead trout. These are rainbow trout that go out into the ocean, get big there, bring up those nutrients and uh, spawn back in their freshwater. They are a threatened species that does give us um, some additional leverage. And unfortunately, uh, we take uh, uh, most of the water out of the Tuolumne. Um, in an average year, we take almost 80% for agriculture and urban uses. And the breakdown in those uses is very similar to the state, 80% for agriculture, 20% for the Bay Area. And this has had a huge impact on, <clears throat> on the Tuolumne River. And you can see that here. Um, those rivers on the right there are the three major tributaries to the San Joaquin. They're the ones that have been addressed in the Bay Delta Plan phase one. And this is basically just looking at, you know, how well are we doing at the goal of doubling salmon populations? And you can see we've been losing uh, salmon in the San Joaquin rivers and the Tuolumne is the worst river of all the main ones in California in the Central Valley. So something we've been counting on is that the State Water Board does have a say in the FERC licensing that they are, they have the authority to issue what's called a water quality certification. So that's a really powerful tool. Um, unfortunately, there was a ruling called the Hoopa Valley decision, Hoopa Valley Tribe, that basically said that an old way of getting around a problem um, was inappropriate. And the old way of getting around the problem, well, first of all, the problem was that FERC gives the state a year to issue the water quality certification. The problem is that the environmental review is never done in a year and the, those who are responsible for it are the project proponents. 
and so what would happen is the project proponent would, after, when a year was almost up, they would withdraw and then resubmit their application. But now that's being challenged. The um, FERC has uh, said that the, the State Water Board has waived their right, their authority to issue these water quality certifications. That's happened on six rivers. There's a lot going on right now um, because so many dams were built about 50 years ago. And there was a bill, um, a, a trailer bill that we were hoping would be introduced last week uh, that would um, get around this problem by allowing the state to issue the certification. And then after environmental review is done, then they could amend it. It did not make it to the floor last week, but we've heard it's likely to come back this week. Every day I feel a little less optimistic, but that's something that we've been um, working on just for the last couple of weeks. So a few other things we have been doing on the lower Tuolumne, you know, under Patrick's leadership, um, working on the Tuolumne River Parkway, a series of parks that provide wildlife habitat and also safe, easier access for communities. Many of them are low income, the communities that we, we organize in. Uh, so that's a wonderful project coming along. And again, under Patrick's leadership, 10 year project, we uh, finally removed the dangerous and deadly Dennett Dam. Uh, here it is being removed. It took a lot of time and money to get the permits and convince City of Modesto to partner with us. And in the end, it was a great celebration. The mayor is there with us. Uh, so that was a, a wonderful recent victory. Patrick also led the charge on purchasing Dos Rios, 1600 acres at the confluence with the San Joaquin. And that is being restored to wildlife habitat. That uh, beautiful bunny there is the riparian brush rabbit, one of the most endangered species. And we have seen, they've been um, seen at Dos Rios. So they're repopulating the area. So the San Joaquin then flows into the Delta and into the Bay. And we are doing a lot more work around the Bay Delta issues because it's all connected. That's really part of the, the greater watershed. And uh, the state is updating the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan. Uh, this was required by the Endangered or by the Clean Water Act. It was first adopted in 1978. It was updated in 95, but there's really been no, no changes in 25 years. So we see this as a one in a generation opportunity to improve conditions. Uh, the, the Delta is a remarkable uh, habitat, uh, over 500 species of fish and wildlife. Uh, early Western explorers just have wonderful tales to tell about birds lifting in the air and, and it going dark because they um, sh shaded the sun. And um, you know, you could almost felt like you could walk across these rivers on the backs of salmon. They were so thick. The uh, Delta and Bay are a major stopover for the Pacific Flyway, a migration corridor for anadromous fish like salmon and steelhead that start their lives in freshwater, then live in the ocean, and then return to spawn. And a lot has changed. Like just like with the Tuolumne, we've had those impacts. A uh, huge impact has been levees that constrain the river. They want to uh, keep the farmland from flooding. And then there's diversions from uh, upstream that have had a huge impact. And the low flows are important, are a problem for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is water quality and temperature. This photo is from the Klamath River in 2008 when uh, there was a bad move to divert a lot of water for farmers in Oregon. Uh, when the salmon were coming up to spawn and 70,000 died. Obviously fish need water for moving around, uh, coming into their river to spawn and getting flushed out as juveniles so that they can uh, live their lives in the, in the ocean. And it's really, floodplains are really important because you see the channel there, that's where the big predator fish, many of them non-native live. And if the juveniles, the babies have access to these floodplains, they have a refuge and there's also a lot more food there. So if they have access, they can grow to be about twice as big. And then when it's time for them to out migrate, they have a much better um, ability to survive predation and other challenges along the way. So we've essentially changed the ecosystem um, from a fast moving, cold Sierra River to a slow moving warm stream. 
and plants and animals that have evolved in the current conditions are now have a competitive advantage over the natives. This is water hyacinth. And during the drought, there were miles and miles of this clogging up the river. It can double in biomass in two weeks. And below this, there probably are all sorts of non-natives, black bass, striped bass, and other um, problematic fish. So the, the, um, the, our opponents in these issues say, oh, the problem is predator, non-native predators. But really, that's a symptom of the problem, that we've created an ecosystem that favors them. So there's a, a very close correlation between uh, flows and the success of the, the juvenile salmon and steelhead getting, getting out into the ocean, and then two and a half years coming back to spawn. Can't really argue with that tracking there. Um, problems in the delta, including cyanobacteria, uh, which produces neurotoxins that can uh, make people sick, kill pets and wildlife, and plus it looks pretty disgusting. I don't think anyone would want to swim in that. And changing the, uh, the salinity balance of the, the bay and parts of the delta, uh, this impacts everything from uh, plankton all the way up the food web. You can see here that in the last in a 50 year span, there was one year, that little black blip at 1977, when the bay experienced super critically dry conditions, but because and if, if in an unimpaired uh, situation, if there are no dams and diversions. But the actual, in 40% of the years, uh, the, the situation was super critical. And in 60% of the years, it was either dry or super critical. So huge impact on the Bay Delta. And that's reflected in fish populations. And that works its way all the way up the food chain to orcas that depend on salmon. So phase one of the Bay Delta plan, again, focuses on the San Joaquin Basin, the Stanislaw, Tuolumne, and Merced. And it was a long slog, but we did convince the State Water Board to vote uh, to establish higher flows, and it's based on unimpaired flow. So it's a percentage of what would naturally flow down the rivers between February and June, and those are really critical months for the baby fish. Uh, so that was a huge victory. You know, the science said that the, the river really needed 60%, um, and the State Water Board kind of compromised, well, you know, it's 20% now, 60%. We got to balance out different um, beneficial uses. Uh, but it would be a huge change if this is actually implemented. So it's adopted now, but not implemented. And um, there's some flexibility to it, something called adaptive management. The State Water Board, they can require higher flows, but they can't require habitat restoration measures, um, which we call non-flow measures. But we really need both. We need to restore floodplains, and we need to make sure they're inundated and activated. So what the State Water Board has done is they said, it's, we're going to start at 40%. If biological goals are met, and they're working on that now, what those goals will be, um, then flows could go down to 30%. And if they're not being met, they could go up to 50%. So there's a real incentive to get it right. Uh, you can't just check off a bunch of things and shrug your shoulders if they don't work out. Uh, the, that's what the, the water agencies want is voluntary agreements, which is basically a checklist. They want to um, do non-flow measures and very little when it comes to flows. And we believe they're destined to fail. And they'll say, it's like, gosh, you know, we tried and it just didn't work out. So we're not big fans of that. Um, when Gavin Newsom got elected governor uh, that very day, he and uh, Governor Brown, outgoing governor, sent a letter to the State Water Board saying, hey, we know you're planning on voting on the Bay Delta plan tomorrow. Can you give the voluntary agreements a little bit more time? Um, State Water Board agreed, but come December 12th, they ended up voting. But Gavin Newsom has really embraced the voluntary agreements. And so that was kind of strike one. And then in January, he didn't reappoint Felicia Marcus, who um, was a wonderful chair and so that was strike two. And then in the fall, he vetoed SB1, which was um, a, a law that would have protected California from the Trump environmental rollback. box. So that was strike three. But then um, the federal government, they issued what's called biological opinions for the Delta that said, hey, we could take more water and it won't impact endangered species. And Trump came to Bakersfield and signed an order to make it easier to take more water from the Delta for agriculture. 
And at that point, um, Gavin Newsom in the state sued the federal government. So that takes away one of his strikes. So he's only at strike two right now. And he does seem to be getting a little bit better. So shortly after the Bay Delta plan was adopted, the irrigation districts that operate uh, Don Pedro Dam, they sued. We expected that. We were hoping we could convince the San Francisco PUC not to, but they joined in. And then Valley Water and Bosca and others uh, joined in. And we've been putting a lot of pressure on Valley Water to drop their lawsuit. Uh, it, they don't benefit, the, the phase one doesn't impact their water supply. So they were doing it more to get a seat at the table and to kind of back up San Francisco. But now they're getting ready to go to the voters for a ballot measure, a funding measure, partial tax in November. And that's given us a lot of leverage. So we've been um, pressuring them for a year and a half. And just in this last week, we've been sending in a lot of uh, emails and I sent them a, a letter on Monday. Last night, they had a board meeting when they were discussing this uh, measure and we had people speak there. Um, they have a new CEO. I've talked to him a couple times this week and he said, you know, he thought the lawsuit was a mistake. He's gonna recommend that they drop it. And he thinks the majority of the board agrees with that and uh, they're likely to make a decision on July 14th. So that'll be a nice little victory if that comes about as expected. So San Francisco has a, you know, an interesting relationship with uh, the Modesto and Turlock Irrigation Districts, kind of like siblings. They don't always get along, but they got to figure out ways to do that. Uh, San Francisco did sign this agreement that basically said that they would follow the district's uh, negotiating position when it comes to fish flows. So that's very problematic. <clears throat> um, shortly after the, the environmental document for the Bay Delta Plan came out, the um, San Francisco PUC, they went on their political campaign. They said it was going to cost us 188,000 jobs. $49 billion in economic hit. And so we went to work and said, no, that's not true. Look, we reduced our water use by 30% in a 10 year period, 2006 to 2016, which was the time of this. And according to your economic analysis, we should have lost 25,000 jobs and six and a half billion dollars, but that didn't happen. You see the blue line, um, jobs grew by 27%. And water use, the orange line, water use dropped by 23%. So this information was very convincing to the state water board. It made the SFPUC look pretty foolish. Um, we've also um, worked a lot with the SFPUC and Bosca, which represents their customers outside of San Francisco. We, um, we coordinated the Silicon Valley Water Conservation Awards for 10 years. Uh, this is part, our, our Revive the Tuolumne campaign has two legs. One is let it flow. We need more water flowing down the river. And the other is use it wisely, that we need to be efficient with water. We need to use alternative water supplies like recycled water so that we have more water available and can feel comfortable that we're not gonna uh, run out of water um, and, and, and be able to uh, restore the Tuolumne and Bay Delta ecosystem. So here's kind of something kind of fun, water demand. In, in uh, 2007, the SFPUC projected that by 2018, demand in the whole service area would be 285 million gallons per day. But we negotiated a, a sales cap, that was a big victory. Um, they were planning to divert an additional 25 million gallons of water per day from the Tuolumne. We stopped that and they capped sales at 265 and they committed to um, working with Bosca to do more conservation and recycled water and groundwater use. And then 2013, before the drought even kicked in, demand was down to 223. And that was largely due to the fact that the price of water was increasing to pay for these seismic upgrades. You see the word um, WSIP a little bit above, that's Water System Improvement Program, $4.8 billion in seismic upgrades. We gotta pay for that somehow, so water rates have gone up and that sent a price signal. And then we had the uh, drought declaration and the governor's mandate and demand got down to 175 in 2016. That's lower than it was in 1977, despite population growth. And it hovered around there. And then it climbed a little bit to 196 in 2018. So the difference between what they projected and the actual is 31%. So more good ammo for us that, you know, how much of this um, analysis can we really trust? 
Last year, it actually dropped a little bit down to 192. So it's not rebounding like they projected. And again, you know, one of the reasons is as the cost of water goes up, demand goes down. And even their 10 year financial plan for the next 10 years, they're projecting a decline in water sales of half a percent per year. So we like to use their own graphs and information when we make our comments. And something that we, it's important for us to do is that um, the SFPUC staff, they really depended on people not understanding their system. So they could just say things like, we're gonna face 50% rationing at the first sign of drought and it's gonna have all these economic impacts. So we walk through decision makers and um, you know, here's the, their system. Um, the water comes from Hetch Hetchy and the Bay Area reservoirs. There are a couple other SFPUC reservoirs on the Tuolumne that generate hydropower and um, help them meet their obligation to uh, meet the, the irrigation district's senior water rights. Um, Don Pedro Reservoir, the SFPUC, paid for about half of that and they got a water bank. And so when there's a lot of water, they can prepay water into that bank. And then if we hit some dry years, they can take water at Hetch Hetchy they otherwise wouldn't be entitled to and subtract an equal amount from the water bank. So this is how the water rights work. The first 2,400 cubic feet per second, and imagine a basketball, that's about a cubic foot. 2,400 basketballs floating down the river. Um, anything below that belongs to the irrigation districts. Anything above that belongs to the SFPUC. There is a little two month period and during the, uh, the snow melt when that goes up to 4,000. And you can see in wet years, the SFPUC is entitled to a lot of water and in the dry years, uh, that's when they get really nervous. <clears throat> but in an average year, they're entitled to three times as much water as they need. So even if you had a, a sequence like we just had, where you had four very dry years and one average year, you see that their storage um, is in pretty good shape. And they really depend on this storage. They actually have you know, one and a half million acre feet, an acre foot being about a football field, a foot deep in water. And current demand is about 215,000 acre feet. So you can see that you know, there's enough water to last at least six years. It would take a six year mega drought um, to, to work through that storage. And at the height of the recent drought, they had enough water to last three years. So other communities were really nervous about running out. And we didn't really publicize this because we wanted to encourage conservation, but um, SFPUC was in good shape. And you see them that the, the water really came out of the water bank. Uh, so that was very useful. And you see it uh, starting to climb up into 2016. And by the summer of 2016, there was enough water to last five years. So the state was still technically in drought and the SFPUC storage was at 85%. And then 27. Hey, yeah, go um, on. We have, well, yeah, we have some questions coming in and it's 6.30, so we do want to be respectful of folks' time. If you could just um, kind of wrap up with a few final thoughts, that would be great. Okay, um, 12 years worth of water in 2017, they had to dump most of it. Uh, we showed that they could get through um, the six year drought of record with modest rationing if they're reasonable. They have something called the design drought that combines the two worst droughts together at much higher demand. Uh, much worse than, much more strict than other water agencies. We've done uh, professional polling, found tremendous support for the Tuolumne in the Bay and San Francisco, that people can serve water to benefit the environment, but it didn't benefit the environment during the recent drought and that makes people angry. Here you see that for five years, the unimpaired flow was just 12% and all that water we conser conserved had to be dumped in 2017 when it was 79%. And right now we have a number of scenarios that show how they could uh, manage the river. I won't go through these, but if anyone's interested in learning more about that, I, am, I would be happy to uh, connect with you. And uh, here's my email and thank you for a little bit extra time. I see I'm at 21 minutes. So um, I, I did okay, I think. <laughs> thank you.